It's a pleasure to speak to you today about uh, image quality and diagnostic accuracy. I am Esan Sameh. I am at Duke University Medical Center. I would like to acknowledge uh, members of my laboratory at Duke who have uh, contributed, to, to, contributed to some of the material that I'm presenting today. We all uh, appreciate and acknowledge that imaging provides a significant clinical benefit. And that benefit often translates in the context of image quality. Image quality is something that is universally appreciated, but it has been elusive to define and to measure. Imaging also provides an element of cost. In the context of CT, one of the uh, aspects of cost is radiation dose. Uh, almost universally uh, recognized that radiation dose is not a good thing. It is universally depreciated. However, it is unclear how we can reduce radiation dose and what would be the impact of that and by how much we can reduce radiation dose. Doing imaging properly requires an optimized approach in balancing image quality with radiation dose. Optimization is a science that involves four specific steps. First of all, if there is a harm associated with the imaging, we need to have reasonable measures of the risk involved. Um, of course, if there is no harm, and we don't believe if there is a harm, then there is no reason to do the optimization in the first place. But if there is a finite amount of harm, then we need to have reasonable measures of that. In the same way, we need to have reasonable measures of image quality. If they have those things quantified, then we put them in balance with respect to each other by targeted adjustment of the system settings, and um, that would achieve an optimum balance between image quality and radiation dose. And of course, whatever we devise in that process needs to be standardized and needs to be implemented in the context of a clinical uh, facility. So, optimization involves the risk, the benefit, the balance, and the implementation. Today, I will be speaking only in the context of benefit or the image quality. Here, I'm showing you an image, a CT image uh, of a kidney stone uh, acquired at 380 MA, and this is an image of the same patient uh, at 18% uh, of that dose. Uh, you see that the kidney lesion is not depicted exactly the same way. However, uh, is still fully detectable. This is a, another example. I'm showing you a liver lesion, and you see how the depiction of that lesion varies as a function of radiation dose. But uh, is the image on the right at the lowest possible dose setting acceptable or not? Uh, you see this is a judgment call. Uh, again, this is yet another example. Of course, we can rely on our subjective uh, evaluation of image quality. How, but those are qualitative, uh, and that subjective assessment might not necessarily translate, translate into diagnostic performance. The problem that we have is that image quality changes monotonically with radiation dose. Higher dose gives you higher image quality. So how much is good enough? How much image quality is adequate for the purpose of the clinical decision making? In order to be able to make that determination, we need to have measures of image quality. What is image quality? Again, we often think in terms of image aesthetics when we talk about image quality, which are subjective and qualitative. However, image quality is best characterizing, characterized in terms of diagnostic accuracy. The problem with diagnostic accuracy is that very, it is very difficult and expensive to measure. Um, especially considering that there are many factors that affect image quality and radiation dose. And if for every specific setting we need to make the measurement, uh, the problem become, becomes quickly impractical. As a result, we have developed physical metrics of image quality by, by imaging specific objects. We call them phantoms uh, and measuring attributes such as radiation uh, uh, those uh, resolution, of course, for image quality and noise. However, the measurements are limited in the scope, 
but but they can be related to diagnostic uh, performance. I will as I will be illustrating under very qualified conditions. What are the, some of the some of the metrics that they use for image quality in that regard? Contrast noise ratio is the most common one. Model observer metrics and also quantitative metrics. What is contrast noise ratio? Contrast noise ratio is a metric as defined in this slide uh, that uh, that give us an indication of detectability of a lesion at a constant resolution and noise texture in the background. It is related to work of Albert Rose in 1948 and provides the first order approximation of image quality. It is also task generic, does not make any differentiation whether you are looking at a large object or a small object, whether you're looking at an object in a uh, texture background or more uniform background. Here's an illustration as to why I think contrast noise ratio is good, but not good enough. Uh, these are depictions of the same lesion with the same contrast noise ratio, and you agree with me that the detectability of the lesion is not the same across the three images that I'm showing you. If you measure the noise of this background in terms of uh, the metric of noise power spectrum, the, these three images have dramatically different noise power spectra. And as a result, the lesion would be depicted differently. Um, this is another example of iterative reconstruction and filter pack projection. The two lesions that I'm showing you, not lesions here, of course, this is just test objects, have exactly the same contrast noise ratio, but the appearance of the images are very different. So we need to have metrics of image quality that are better than contrast noise ratio. What are the parameters that affect image quality? These are some of the parameters that I have listed here, uh, 10 parameters. You can think about the first four uh, reflecting the features of interest uh, in an image. Contrast, lesion size, lesion shape, and lesion edge profiles. The other three can be reflecting the details, the level of details in the images, resolution, viewing distance, and the display device itself. And finally, there are always distractors in our uh, process of diagnosis. Um, things such as the noise that is present in the image as well as the noise that the operator um, brings forth to the uh, perception process. So if you put, come up with a metric that put all of these elements, features of interest, imaging details, and distractors together, perhaps we can come up with a better metric of image quality. There are a, uh, uh, the series of models that are out there, we call them model observers, that essentially integrate the noise properties of the imaging system, the noise power spectrum, in terms of distractors that are present, uh, as well as the imaging details and the features of interest. Uh, these are complicated equations. I don't expect you to fully appreciate and understand them with only one slide here. But generally speaking, uh, the distractor element of the perception process is in the denominator of these equations, usually reflecting the context of noise power spectrum, which shows gives us not only the magnitude of the noise, but also the texture of the noise, as well as the attributes of the feature of interest, the task function, that essentially tells us whether we are looking at a large lesion or a small lesion, a high contrast lesion or a low contrast lesion, and what is the morphology of the lesion, as well as the MTF, uh, which reflects the um, full spatial frequency component of the, uh, of the imaging system in terms of how the imaging system uh, portrays the uh, spatial resolution that is present uh, in the imaging system. And this is, these models are essentially um, a, a fancy form of contrast noise ratio. And what they brings forth to us to, uh, is a metric that we call D prime that is related to the detectability index. And you can relate that metric to the area under the ROC curve, which is the best metric of uh, diagnostic accuracy that we have. In order to be able to make these measurements, you need to have proper phantom, proper object that reflect different sizes of patients and also reflects different attributes of the lesion. So we have found, for example, for iterative reconstruction for CT, that the resolution, the MTF that we measure, 
is dependent on the patient size and also dependent on the contrast of the lesion. And therefore, we have generated the phantom at Duke uh, that is a task-based image quality metrology phantom. It has different sizes corresponding to different patient sizes. And inside each one of the elements of the phantom, we have lesions or targets of different contrast level correspond to contrast levels that we encounter in clinical practice. And therefore, we are able to make a resolution measurement that is reflective of the patient size and also the lesion attribute of interest. We have developed a computer software that essentially integrates the data from the phantom and provides us uh, reflections of the modulation transfer function as well as the noise bar spectrum as a function of patient size and the contrast level and so on and provides us a metric of D prime a measurement of D prime and from that we can extract the area under the ROC curve which is a predicted area under the ROC curve so essentially with this methodology we can make a physical measurement and predict what uh, would be the quality of the image in terms of diagnostic accuracy for an actual human observer, a radiologist. How good are we in that process? Uh, here is some uh, benchmark work that we have done. We have a correlated R measurement um, estimation of the area under the ROC curve, AZ, as a function of radiation dose on the x-axis that you see over here, um, um, and also as well as uh, as a function of contrast of the lesion. Um, the solid lines, the red solid lines, reflect the actual performance of human observers, radiologists, expert radiologists. And the data points are different models uh, that we have incorporated into our calculations. And you see that all in all, uh, the predictions of the model observers are very, very close to the actual human performance. So the question you will ask yourself that, well, we do have the, this good metric of image quality, how can we use it? Uh, so this illustration is supposed to show us a reflect a, a universal paradigm or outlook that one might use. If you want to optimize an imaging system, what you actually can turn, the knobs that you have control over, are the scan parameters, things, things such as KVP or MA and so on. Um, so as you change those parameters, of course, you change the output of the scanner. It can be characterized in terms of CTDI or SSDE or any other metric that is out there. And of course, that output is somewhat related to the risk or the harm, likelihood of harm that the patient would have, um, which would be, of course, patient size dependent as well as the gender and anatomy dependent. Um, so essentially, if you map this zone, you can figure out how the changes in a, in a particular parameter can impact the likelihood of harm that might be present in that imaging system. On the other side, as you make that adjustment in the scan parameter, you also make changes into that metric of image quality that you might have, contrast noise ratio or D prime. And that dependency is also patient size specific. Uh, as I showed you in the mercury phantom of different sizes uh, earlier. And then you can relate that metric into the performance index, uh, such as the area under the ROC curve. Uh, if you do so, then you have a way to relate uh, the, the harm of imaging to the goodness of imaging. And if you have that, then you have a platform for optimization. How can you put them into practice? Here is an example. Um, this is a complicated plot. These are four different plots. Uh, and in all of them, I'm showing you the area under the ROC curve plotted as a function of either CTDI or SSDE or effective dose or what we call um, risk index, which is a, something like effective dose that but incorporates the gender and the um, size uh, and the age of the patient. Uh, the different curves that are present here, uh, showing dif you different sizes of the pediatric patients from very uh, small neonate all the way to a 15-year-old. And you see as we um, go from one size to another, the, the, the curves change. But all the curves uh, share a common form. They start with the high slope 
and then they sort of plateau at the higher uh, dose levels. Uh, the fact that they plateau, it provides us a basis by which we can do the optimization. Essentially, you do not want to operate in the highest slope part of these curves um, because you will be very vulnerable if you have made wrong assumptions. If you are on the right side, however, too far to the right, in fact, then you are doing a disservice to the patient. You are using more than necessary radiation without really gaining very much in terms of image quality. So what you really want to be is on the cusp of these curves. Um, so you can think about the isogradient condition as an operating point for your imaging system. And that's what we have tried to implement uh, at Duke University for our uh, pediatric imaging uh, uh, performance. So let me conclude. Image quality is paramount um, in any imaging operation. Uh, however, ensuring image quality requires science, requires good surrogates of image quality that are task and indication specific. And there are protocol specific. I only talked about in context of one protocol, but you can essentially extend this work to any protocol, and we have done that uh, in our institution. And that are patient specific in terms of size, gender, and anatomy. Um, we also cannot really talk about image quality in isolation from radiation dose. I did not focus on that. I am relying on my colleagues to talk about that in the context of this particular symposium. But you need to have good surrogates of those that are individualized, in my opinion. There are a scalar uh, that so you can have only one number per patient. And also needs to be cross-modality. We should be able to add um, those from different modalities together in order to get a total sort of index of uh, risk, as opposed to having modality-specific metrics. Then we can use this quality dose gradient uh, uh, platforms that I indicated earlier uh, as a basis to achieve the highest quality at lowest radiation dose. Essentially, this is the science becomes a science behind the Alara principle. And we can define an operating point um, um, to achieve a, uh, a, a optimum balance between image quality and dose. I think finding the optimum point should be the goal of our science, not necessarily just reducing radiation dose, because we don't want to harm the patient unintentionally by, by uh, uh, getting images that are suboptimal from a diagnostic stand. I thank you for your attention, and uh, I will be accessible by email or electronically if I can answer any